Lord, you're so worthy. So worthy. Oh, we just thank you for your great grace. We thank you for your presence here today. We thank you, Father God, for your goodness. We just thank you that we can come openly and praise and worship you. King of kings and Lord of lords, you are so worthy of it all. Oh, we thank you, Father God. Oh, Rahadabaha, Jesus, so worthy, so worthy. Wow. That worship was absolutely beautiful this morning. Wow. Presence of God, huh? The presence of God. Look at all these wonderful kids out here. Mother's Day. Woohoo! Go on, your mums. Mums are amazing. Mums are amazing. So this morning, I just wanted to say happy Mother's Day to all our beautiful mums. We're all here because of our beautiful mums. We've survived because of our beautiful mums. And thank you for bringing us into this uh, world and giving us a chance. Um, but we just wanted to say thank you. I know it's a drizzly old day out here, but I just feel the presence of God in here. And this wonderful family we call Salt. And we just honour you. We love you. Value you. Treasure you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your patience with us. Your grace. All that timeless effort and your goodness. And we just thank you that God shone through you to us as kids. Whatever that looks like, we just thank all the mums today. I wanted to invite some of the guys to come up and just to honour you. We've, just, we've got cupcakes to give out to the mums. There's chocolates in the basket as you came in. Coffee at the coffee shop, I um, in the thing. But I want to invite a few of the uh, dads and guys to come up and to just bring around to all the mums some cupcakes. Handmade by our beautiful Hannah, a gorgeous mum. So if you could, sorry darling, sorry darling, I'll watch where I'm going. But um, it's just to say thank you. Um, you can, mums, you can eat during the service. Feel free to just dig in and enjoy your cupcake. And uh, I thought some of the mums would sleep in this morning and just get breakfast in bed. It's just amazing to see so many people here this morning. Ah, Steph. And all our beautiful mums-to-be. We've got quite a few mums on the way, which is awesome. Okay. Has every mum received a cupcake? Yes. yes? Are they good? Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> All right. We're just going to um, continue our worship um, with giving this morning. So if the guys who are doing the, um, I know that's more, but people that are Um, could come out and help us with the offering. That would be awesome. Whoops. I'm going to watch where I stand because I'm going to... These beautiful kids. It's going around. Thanks, guys. If you could just take up the offering. And we're just going to pray over the offering. Father God, we just thank you for your... Just the bounty that you've given us. We thank you that this is a way we show our, our love, just our overflow for your great provision in our lives. We thank you, Father God, that you are the great provider in every area, spirit, soul, and body. 
and we thank you that this is a token of our love back to you. Thank you for that, all the money, we just call a multiplication to it for all that SALT does in the community. And we just thank you for the opportunity to worship you in this way, in Jesus' mighty name. Can I invite John Sornick? Let's, um, we've just got a couple of announcements and we'll go from there. I won't be long. Okay. She's giving me warning already. This is, it's a perfect time to do it at Mother's Day. You've got all this stuff going on, but um, wouldn't it be a fantastic gift for, for your mother, son, husband to get involved in the men's ministry? It'd be great. We've been running, for the last year now, we've been running a series in our men's group. We, we meet on a Tuesday. And the men's group is, we've been running a, a series called The Chosen. And we've gone through three, uh, three episodes. Three, sorry, three series series a lot of episodes and it's been it's been a fantastic time with the guys in doing this and in in some some of the times there must have been a lot of dust in the air because uh, we got a, a couple of the episodes were a bit tear jerkers but we've had a great time in actually in meeting together chatting we it's not a huge group but it's a fantastic group to get involved in like we've been praying in our church for a while now for revival and to get get closer to God's heart and being involved with the men is is where some of it's going to start Amen. and we just we just need to keep focusing on that um, our, the theme of our men's ministry is basically it's it's Proverbs 27 17 and it says iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another but we need men to sharpen each other because if there's no iron then you need two iron so we need people to come keep joining us Hebrews um, Hebrews 10 24 and 25 says and let us consider how to stir up one another. Now, we do that really, really well on a Tuesday, but it's to love and good works. And, and we just shouldn't neglect meeting together. So I just want to encourage some of the guys, if you want to meet in the, in the study, it'll be great Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. It's a great time. We have, it's pizzas, it's drinks. We, we just, it, it only goes for about two hours max, and we have a great time. We're starting a new series this Tuesday, and the series is actually called Wild at Heart. And uh, it's just, there's, it's some good stuff. And we're going to just run a video. It only takes about a minute or so to run. And you can have a look at what we're going to be doing. Guys, this is the start for our church to do the Wild at Heart ministry and just getting involved in it. If you want to be involved in restoring your own hearts and how we move forward, just come and see me afterwards. Matt's done this before and I've asked Matt to just come and say just a couple of words. Thanks, John. My name is Matt. I'm married to Beck and father of two incredible boys. You probably might mistake them for girls because they've got long hair, but they love their long hair. I have done Wild at Heart, and there's at least one other guy I know in here who has done the Wild at Heart probably about six years ago. But in my honest opinion, who thinks men need another study group? I don't think so, because I don't think it works. What men need is they need uh, a band. They need a place where they can share victory. They can share defeat. 
but they can also have laughter and they can also have authentic friendship. And what is happening around the world, it started about 20 something years ago, this is just a new release. We think it's really important for the men to have an opportunity to come and respond and actually open their hearts up. And that won't happen, generally speaking, in a study group or in a church. But what we're finding around the globe is a reawakening of men, sometimes around a fire, sometimes just around other men. So we actually, as a church, really want to invest in that. We've got these books available. If, if you've got one, that's great. But if you don't have one or you would like one, I can get you a free copy. Just come see me or John afterwards. But that's a bit. Remember, guys, this is uh, it's not a, what we're doing on a Tuesday is not a Bible study. It's actually just a, we, we watch a video, we have a chat, we talk. So it's not heavy duty. It's pretty good. Amen. Amen. It's a great book, that, guys. Um, I remember Pete gave me that book and he said, B, you need to understand me a little bit better <laughs> as a twin. And he, I read that book. Girls, it's a great book to understanding your men and the way they're wired. So, um, actually, I loved it. It was fantastic. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to pray a blessing over our mums. Oh, sorry, one more, one more announcement. Sorry Day is coming up. And we actually participate with the, what group? The Lions Club. It's going to be at the Bombardieri base here. We need some assistance on the 20, Friday the 24th for a few hours. We're going to be, they're going to be cooking sausages and Salt are going to be giving the sausages away um, and just serving the people on Sorry Day. So if you could help, Cheryl and Peter are the key people. Um, I meant to tell Jess. Jess and I will be there. We're working on Friday, so we'll be coming down to help. And it's a great way to be a part of our collective called the community in this time, at that time. I wanted to um, pray a blessing over our mums. Hey, and just a blessing. So our gorgeous Steph is going to just pray a blessing. And I encourage us as all of us to sing this over our mums as a blessing and a prayer from our hearts to our gorgeous mums. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. We love our mums. I want to invite Dave to come on up and... Uh, Share the word of God with us today. Thanks for coming on this very wet day. But I believe, you know. Oh, the kids, our wonderful, gorgeous kids. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's, um, the kids go out to ch Kids Church. Don't forget to register at the back there. And uh, thanks so much, kids. You're gorgeous. We love you. Thanks, B. How are we all this morning? Good? It's great. It's uh, great to see so many people get out from the wet, travel through the floodwaters and join, especially on Mother's Day, such a great day of celebration. I've actually been, as I've been so busy sort of preparing to, to take long service leave and doing all the stuff I need to do at work and uh, I've been trying to give the right time to pray about what God, what do you want me to speak on? And it's been a, it's been a difficult one because there's so much sort of going on. But um, yeah, God kept coming back to something which I've never preached really on before. Touched on it, always touch on this subject because it comes in everything. It's central to our, everything we do and central to God himself. And it's not love, but it's joy. And uh, so uh, 
I've done a bit of a word study and just sort of just delved right into the scriptures about joy and, and uh, it's been a really amazing journey. I'd love to share it with you this morning. So the title of this uh, today is Living with Everlasting Fullness of God's Joy in Your Life. Do you want more joy? I certainly do. I want more joy. I want more and more of God's joy. You know, sometimes I think we lose the joy that God has given us. And sometimes that's not our fault. It's not our cause. Sometimes it is. But we know when in the Psalms, um, I love reading through the Psalms, and today I'm going to sort of unpack a psalm about joy and about David's discovering God's joy in his life and how he discovered and returned to God's joy. There's a psalm where, in Psalm 51, it's a famous psalm where David, and we don't know the order of when the psalms are written, but in many of them are songs, written as songs and poetry. And not all of them are written by David, but we know that this particular psalm was written by David, Psalm 51. And part of that psalm, he says, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And sometimes I think that as Christians, uh, we all need to pray and sing that over our lives. And um, before I delve into it, let's do, uh, I, I actually wrote about four pages on a study of joy. I'm not going to read that out. I'm just going to pull out bits that there's so much in the Bible about joy. But I'm just going to pull out a bit about joy uh, and then we're going to look at that psalm and unpack that. So, biblical joy, because if you go into Google and, and sort of write, you know, write the word joy, you get a different meaning. And you actually, when you get, if you go into Google and say, how, do, how does one, one person get joy, it's very humanistic. And it's, it's actually quite oppositional and a parrot, like opposed to what God says about joy. And I'm going to bring that up because I think sometimes as Christians we get lost in, in our living in the world and we, we get down the track of where we, what we think joy is and it's really not that at all. So biblical Christian joy, here's my definition, it's not my definition but it's a definition as I've searched the scriptures. Joy is a deep feeling, yes, an emotion, a feeling, it's not just a feeling though of satisfaction, contentment, and pleasure in the soul, in our soul, deep down in our inner being, produced by the Holy Spirit as he makes us see and savour the glory of Christ. In us, the glory of Christ in us, in his word, in the promises and the riches of his word and in his world. And that means people and everything he's made. I know that's a big definition. I'll read it again. But I'm just going to harp on why I've defined it this way. Joy is a deep down feeling of satisfaction, contentment, pleasure in our soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he makes us see and savour the glory of Christ in us, in his word, and in his world. In 1 Peter, I'm just going to jump around a, a little bit to some of the bits and pieces around some of the key scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Peter talks about how we as Christians are happy with inexpressible and unspeakable joy. In other words, you know, you've, you've heard that, that phrase before. Inexpressible or unspeakable joy. Joy is something that even though I just tried to define with words, it's something that's really difficult to put into words. We can't explain it as a Christian. And if you've really experienced the joy of the Lord, the joy that... Jesus gives you the joy of your salvation, it's very difficult to try and put that into words. 
It's inexpressible. It goes beyond what words can t- don't words don't describe that experience. Um, joy is, as I talked about in the definition, joy is something that God produces in our life. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we know that in Galatians, Paul talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that it's the work. When, when God fills us with his spirit again and again and again, part of that, the fruit of his work in our lives is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. One key characteristic of the kingdom of God is joy. And you've probably heard this scripture in Romans. Paul talks in in Romans chapter 14, verse 7. He says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not, you know, it's not these physical things, but it's deep down, but it's of righteousness, of being in this right relationship of intimacy with the Father through the Spirit in, in Jesus. Through peace, and joy so the kingdom of god is about joy it's a it's a key part of the kingdom in our lives is his joy and his love through us you know have you have you ever had sort of an inclination like a a desire a, a drawing towards people who are not joyful. In other words, they're pretty sad. They're pretty, you know, pretty sad on everything. Critical, depressed. Are you drawn to those sort of people? Hand up if you are. Naturally, we aren't drawn to those sort of people unless we are the joy. And I'll talk about that in a second. But most people in our world are not drawn to people who are sad. And what is it about that? You see, joy is in the center of God. God is joy. We are drawn to this sense of joy. And the the whole reason why the kingdom is about joy is that God, that is part of who we are. That's part of God's testimony in our lives to other people. And I'm not talking about the joy in a person when they get, you know, something, you know, a possession or they've done something. That's not joy. That's very humanistic. And that's what, if you look up in Google, it's, you know, look after yourself. Be kind to yourself. That's going to give you joy. This is actually a really opposed to what the Bible's talking about. I'm not talking about the person who is really happy because things are going well in their life and they have, you know, and we, we can get that sense of contentment, but it's not lasting contentment. So the difference between happiness and joy is that happiness is a fleeting thing. It doesn't last. It isn't sustained. And it comes from our circumstances it comes from things around us it doesn't come from the holy spirit within us and that is the difference and that's something that's very difficult to try and understand unless you know and have experienced the joy of the lord in your life and that's that's why it's inexpressible so joy is central to the to the faith we've learned that but joy is central to actually god himself it is central to who he is and it's also central not to his nature but his creative purpose you know god created everything for his joy we are his joy do you know that you are his joy um, we listened to Meg talk about Hebrews chapter 12. And Jesus says, you know, we're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, the writer of Hebrews says, uh, and that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, 
for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. For the joy set before him. He went through everything and experienced all that pain in his life and that suffering and that isolation and that mocking because of you. You are his joy. You are the apple of his eye. His creative purpose is joy and you are his joy. And I think when, and this is what David's going to unpack, when we discover who God is to us, it allows the Holy Spirit to fulfill more of the fruit of what he wants in our life. And part of that is joy. So let's look right at the end. Let's look into not just Revelation, but into a prophetic book of Isaiah and we see um, actually the climatic glimpse if you like of the final word of where God has his church and his new creation this is in Isaiah and it says this and the ransomed of the Lord that's you and me his church shall return and come to Zion Zion is is heaven it's where God is His presence with singing everlasting joy shall be on their heads. They are wearing, they are adorned with joy, everlasting. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You know, God is most glorified in his church, in his people, when they are most satisfied in him. You know, the word enjoy means to take pleasure in and enjoy. God created you to enjoy him. You see, God is our joy and he, he, is our joy. He is the source of our joy. And nearly 400 years ago, a group of Christian leaders in the church, preachers and elders, came together and they produced what's called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's a big thing for a teaching, a document that was to outline teaching in the church. And one of the summaries of what that was, the purpose of of you and me the purpose of us here on earth do you know what it is our meaning in life according to the scriptures says this our chief end is to glorify god and enjoy him forever you see he is our source of joy not things Not people, but he is our source of joy. Now, just thought I said earlier, who wants to be around sad people? Those with joy in their life. Because we give joy to those around us. We overflow with joy. That is part of our salt and our light. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And God wants us, though, how do we have that? We need to enjoy God. You need to be satisfied in Him. Your satisfaction must come from Him. And if you're not finding joy in Him, you won't find joy. Because the joy that you'll be given is something that's very temporary. Nothing will satisfy them. King Solomon, the wisdom that he asked for from God, he wrote this incredible book, Ecclesiastes. And in that, he said, there is nothing that will satisfy. You know, nothing on this earth will satisfy. What was the, the only thing that he came to, the chief end of man, is to find their satisfaction in their creator. And he, he says that 
it's even better if you do this in your youth. <laughs> Why? Because you'll be going through all of your life here on earth trying to find joy and being not satisfied. And that's why I have such a passion, I'm a teacher, to talk to young people about finding their creator. Not later. Not when you're faced with this, the darkest down place in your life where there's nothing else around and God comes along. Don't wait for that. God wants you to celebrate in who he is every day and it's this entering in to enjoying him in this relationship that brings joy there's so much i could talk about i could talk about how do we lose joy how do you know how do we yeah i could go on but what i want to do is i want to go into psalms 6 chapter 16 and i want to just look at what Dave, David talks about four things, four things that we need in our life to allow God to bring his everlasting, inexpressible joy. In other words, there are four things that we see in God. In other words, God, God is for us that we need to realize, that we need to declare that we need to live into and enter into to allow his Holy Spirit to do that and over, overflow that joy in our life. So I want to just unpack that. You know, there, there's so many commands in Scripture and promises of Scripture concerning joy. You know, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Delight yourself in the Lord. The Psalms is full of joy. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And that's what I'm going to be looking at. Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. So let's just read through the psalm. And then I'm going to just pull out those four things. So if you want to turn with me, if you've got your Bibles, Psalm chapter 16. And only a short psalm, which is good. I'll just read through the 11 verses. Psalm chapter 16, verse 1. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my sovereign Lord. Apart from you, I can do no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more, but I will not pour out liberations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart is instructed by him. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me. To the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So the first thing I want to highlight that David brings out is this petition he says in Psalm 1. Keep me safe, O oh God. At this stage, we don't know what he's, you know, asking God to keep him safe from. Preserve me from something. It could be that David wrote this psalm when he was being um, attacked and he fled from Saul and he was in hiding for many years and he was in fear of his death. We don't know. 
But David was facing, he was in the midst of something or he was reflecting on something in his life which was pretty terrible, a, an issue, a, a major problem and he was asking God to keep him safe. He was petitioning God. But then he moves on to, for you I take my refuge in. You are my refuge. Who is God for you? You see, who you make God to be and you understand your identity in God will depend on your, how you relate to God every day. David saw God as his refuge. Now, what does a refuge mean? It means when you are going through a difficulty in life, a challenge, an issue, you run to that refuge. You seek shelter. You seek protection. Where do you, and the question is, in your life, where do you run to in life's problems and struggles? Because if it's not God, you won't find what he's going to give you, which is joy. You know, James, who was the closest to Jesus, this is not the disciple, the guy who wrote James, he was actually the, the physical blood brother of Jesus. Do you know that? And so he actually didn't believe in Jesus. He thought he was a crazy one, like the whole family did. He wasn't the disciple. But he wrote this book because when... He was one of those 500 who saw Jesus resurrected. He met with him and it all the, the penny dropped and he said, surely you are not just my brother, you are the son of God. And he became a leader in the church of Jerusalem. Do you know that, James? Became a leader. Saul came up to him after his conversion and asked for James's help. James was the leader in Jerusalem. He wrote this book and he said, in chapter 1, he said, consider it pure joy. When you face trials of many kinds, I don't know about you, but most people do not consider trials pure joy, do they? Let's be honest. We run away from them and we hate them and we loathe them. But you see, when, you run, when God is your refuge, it's very different. Who is God? To, when, when you understand that God is your refuge in a time of trouble... That is when you can consider them. That's only when you can consider that pure joy. Why? Because God is going to work through that issue with you. What has James said? God works in you perseverance. And perseverance produces fruit. You will lack nothing. You become mature. In other words, God gives you Strength. Just like Ezra said in, in the book of Nehemiah to the people. The Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you run to him in your refuge. When you celebrate him and not your issue. So the first thing is that let's allow, let's turn toward, let's abide, let's lean into, let's see God like David did as his refuge. I think in our lives we need to do, I know we need to do it a lot more. The next thing, as we look in verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, apart from you I, can, I have nothing. You are my sovereign Lord. He declares that Jesus is his Lord. And later in verse 4, he says this, those who run to other gods will suffer more and more. In other words, he has declared that he, Jesus, his Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, there is no other. He is the sovereign Lord, the Lord of Lords in his life. Not just in creation, but in his life. You are my Lord. There is no other gods. There is no other thing that I would attribute and give my attention to and worship you see joy when we start to follow other gods we lose our joy we lose our joy but when God truly is Lord over all in your life 
you will see the fullness of his joy. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at what he's saying here, let's jump back into the psalm. He values God so highly. He said, it's rubbish. I, I think it's crazy to turn to the, the gods that this world sends up. I am not going to invest in those things and treasure and desire those things. I'm going to see that he is my God. But not just that. Verse 5. He says something quite strange, and I'll interpret it. Uh, sorry, not verse 5. Verse... Ah, yeah, verse 5. You hold... He says, Lord, you alone are my portion and cup. You make my lot secure. What does that mean? Now, back in that day, we don't talk about lots. But it's, it's cast... That's how they made decisions. They cast lots. They even did that in Acts to work out what to do. Instead of asking God, they trusted in luck. But he said, "You, there's no luck apart from you. You are the one who directs my life. You are the one. And we're going back to James. When we see that everything that happens in our life, God will make from ashes that the enemy destroys and burns up. That's what ashes is. It's the leftovers. God will bring beauty out of when we see and we acknowledge that God is sovereign, then we know that it's him who decides. He rules over my life. He holds my lot. Whatever happens in my life, I can trust that he is going to work things through for my good and for his pleasure, for his glory. Even if that, means my end there are christians around the world who face persecution and one of the blessings is blessed are you jesus said this is the the, the sermon on that when you are insulted or persecuted in my name stephen who was about to be stoned looked up and he saw the face of god he was filled it said he said it that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll read it out. He was so filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? He was so filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love and joy. You know what he did? He did exactly, this is, he did exactly what Jesus did. He said, Father, please don't hold this against them. The people who were staying them. Please forgive them. And I don't know about you, but that comes from a heart of joy he was looking up into heaven that comes from a place of deep deep joy this is not happiness this is joy guys joy unspeakable joy that he had in his heart that he was able to forgive if we keep going on into verse 5 uh, it says as i said i read that before lord you alone are my portion and cup you make my lot secure. This is declaring the declaration again in verse 2. He says, apart from you, I have no good thing. What's he talking about when he says, you are my portion and, and my cup? Well, just think about this. If there were hundreds of portions of food and drink spread out, hundreds of them, it means the only choice that he would make is God himself. Even if it meant that he didn't have to eat. So God is all that he needs. God is his treasure. God is everything to him. His portion, it's, it's the portion of that sirloin. It's the finest wine. God is that to him. It's like um, a treasure. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, he talks about the parable of a man who finds his treasure in a field. What does he do? This treasure, he has so much joy because he's found this treasure that he goes away, he sells everything and he buys this field for this treasure. David says, you are my portion. I invest everything into you. 
A Christian is a person by the sovereign grace of God has found this treasure. Jesus has become your supreme pleasure in life. You enjoy God more than you enjoy anything because he is the only one who satisfies. Now that doesn't mean that you don't enjoy the other things of the world, but it means that you enjoy them with God in relationship with him. And if you had to, you would give up everything because he is everything to you. Jesus was his portion and his cup. He lacked nothing apart from God. He was the one who satisfied. The last thing that Jesus talks about, the fourth thing, verse 7. Not only, God is not only his refuge, his treasure, his sovereign Lord, he is also his counsellor. It says, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. If we are in, you know, basically in, even in the night, my heart is instructed by you. Day and night. What's he talking about? Well, the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, I'm going to, I'm leaving you guys, you know, the disciples, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And what's the Holy Spirit called? The counselor. The one who counsels. I ask you this question, who is God to you? Jesus is your counsellor. David saw, he declared over his life that he was being counselled by God. That his counsellor was God himself and only. His healer, the one who gave him advice, the one who actually he went to for everything. He counsels you. He teaches you. He admonishes you. He directs you. He steers you when you're being tempted. He is the counselor who shows you and guides you out of it. And James, you know, going back to the book of James, when someone is tempted, God is not the tempter, but he gives us a way. The Holy Spirit counsels us in those times. When we are counseled by the world, we get, you know, James talks about that. We, we get thrown and tossed by the sea. We are not secure in him who is our joy. And so we drift off from joy. We drift off on this path away from joy. But he, when he is your counselor, he will seek he will continue to help you seek him and it's it's you know what it's almost like um when we get into habits in our lives of being counseled by someone it's very difficult to get out of it we become attached but in a positive way (laughs) when you build habits of being counseled by god it's very difficult to get away from that Because that's that relationship, you know, he is the one who, the only one who can bring healing. Not like any earthly counsellor. Now, God has been my counsellor and continues to be my counsellor through the the most difficult times in my life. God has been there counselling and mending my heart. Now, someone was talking to me before the church, it's a very difficult time in Mother's Day. Because their mother was not there for them when they were needed. They were abusive. God is our counsellor. God can be your counsellor. He is the only one who actually knows us better than ourselves. The Holy Spirit, and this is the miracle of joy, is that out of those ashes comes beauty, comes everlasting joy. And this is the miracle of the fullness of God's joy, is that it's not dependent on our history. It's not dependent on our circumstances. It's dependent on Him and only Him. He rewrites our story, and it's a story of joy. 
It's a story of so much joy, like I said, is that when people see you, they say, I want what you've got. I want what you've got. I want your joy. I want what that person, I don't know what it is, but I want what they've got. And what are they talking about? Talking about the joy of the Lord. They're talking about Jesus. And even though this person has walked this road, they are filled with joy. That's a miracle. The miracle of God's joy. And I believe that God wants to restore our joy. He wants to restore the joy that you have inherited in Him. David talks about his inheritance. He says... I keep my eyes always on the Lord, with him at my right hand. I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. Verse 6, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. A delightful, a wonderful, a rich, a beautiful inheritance. What's he talking about? He's talking about the kingdom of God which is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy. Jesus is our inheritance. Eternal and everlasting joy. And then he goes on. This is where the whole book changes. Whenever you see the therefore. So these four things he's declared in his life. He says, therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. He's, even, he's saying here that this joy isn't just for this life, but it's everlasting. You know, and this is actually messianic, which means that it's actually pretelling what, you know, Jesus is. David was in the line of Jesus. And he was, it was prophesied to him. That he, he was going to be in that. He knew that. And the Holy Spirit was speaking through David here. And Peter gets up and acts. And you know what? He, he mentions this. He mentions this and he says. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that he would not be abandoned to death, nor his flesh see corruption. Then Jesus Christ raised him up, and of that we are all witnesses. He was, he was referring back to what they knew, and that was one of these psalms. You see, Jesus, had, it's resurrection joy. This is a joy that goes on, and this is what David was saying, this is a joy that isn't separated by death. And this is why I read in Isaiah that we will, we will go in to Zion. And what will be on our heads? Everlasting joy and gladness. But the great thing is, is that our inheritance is now. We enter into that now. And we enter into the fullness of who God is now. You know, God wants to give you more and more and more joy than you've ever had. And you know, it's interesting when, when we have a revival, when the Holy Spirit moves sovereignly, you know, the one part of the fruit of the Spirit that's so obvious, joy, unspeakable joy. I don't know if you've ever been part of a revival. Or ever seen or experienced it. But it's incredible. It's incredible. But we don't have to wait for revival. Because the Holy Spirit is within us. He is within us. And David has given us these these keys to allow the Holy Spirit to operate and give us more. What are they? God is my refuge. God is sovereign over everything in my life. God is my counselor. 
God is my treasure in, in this life. And when I see all and enter into all of that in my God, it, it, that God is to me, then he will begin to give me more and more and more of the fruit of joy in my life. It will abound and be and will overflow. Does that mean we have to walk around smiling? No. But it means no matter what you go through, God is your joy. And he will burst forth in your countenance, in your actions, in your words, in your reactions, in your responses. They will be joyful. Just like Stephen when he was facing being stoned. You know who was stoning him? Saul. Isn't that interesting? Forgive them. God, I ask you one thing, that you would not hold this against them. And he didn't. Isn't that a beautiful story? You know, it doesn't matter what you're going to go through and what you are going through. God is your source of joy. Nothing else. He is your refuge. He is your counsellor. He is your treasure. He is your sovereign Lord. Let me pray for us, guys. I want you to put your hand on your heart. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you are with us always. You are within us. And sometimes we are not aware of your presence with us, Lord. We want more of you, Lord. Lord, we want more of your joy in our life. And just as we've learned about David and about how he came to the therefore, then he came to the realization and the, and the overflow of your abundance and everlasting joy. Lord, we want to enter into that each day. We want to wake up saying that you are sovereign, Lord. We want to wake up knowing and going to bed, knowing that you are our treasure in this life, that you mean everything and more than anything. Apart from you, there's nothing that's good. Lord, we want to see you and, and operate every day with you as our counselor, the one that we turn to, the one that we listen to, the one that directs us and helps us and guides us, admonishes us and disciplines us. You are our counsellor. And Lord, thank you so much that you accomplish this by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask for you to come right now and bring your deep, deep joy in our lives. Lord, show us the times where we haven't been seeing you as a refuge, where we haven't sought your counsel, where we've given right to other things and other idols in, our, in this world and not seeing you as Lord over all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bring your joy. Well, thanks this morning, guys. If you, I'm just going to close it there. If you would really like prayer, please don't leave this morning without coming forward and ask. I know the prayer ministry team will be here. Uh, enjoy a cup of tea. Uh, most importantly, if you need to, go and celebrate Mother's Day with your beautiful mothers and your family. Thanks, guys.